a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. I really do appreciate uh, each and every one of you. And also all the people who support me in other ways. Uh, I am so grateful to you. Thank you. Without you, I couldn't do this. And if I couldn't do this, life would be pretty boring. Hey everybody, this is Alan. What you are getting ready to watch is a bit of an experiment. This is something that started out as a plan for an interview uh, with Michael Wydell, a very popular Swedish YouTuber and macro photographer. Uh, but uh, as we talked, it kind of morphed into something a little bit different. We just chatted and uh, we shared our ideas and we, uh, we talked about YouTube, we talked about photography, we talked about life and uh, those of you who don't already know Michael Wydell, I think you are going to be delighted to make his acquaintance. He's a super nice guy, uh, a real delight. And uh, I feel very honored to have uh, met him and talked to him today. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Let me introduce you now to Michael Wydell. Hello. Hi, Alan. Hello. How are you? I am very fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I really appreciate uh, you doing this. I think it's a, I think it's a cool experiment. I'm, uh, I'm excited yeah. to, to, to <laughs> try something different. To it. Is it Michael or Mikhail? Yeah, I mean, uh, please say Michael. Uh, here in Sweden, uh, the the name is pronounced Mikael, but no Mikael? one calls me that. I go, okay. yeah, I go by the nickname Mikke. But the thing is, like, when I talk in English, I prefer to be called Michael because Michael, yeah. not everyone understands, like, what my name is. And it yeah, feels I, more natural to me. Everybody knows you as Michael over here. So. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought we would bat it back yeah. and forth and, and see what see what comes out of it. And, uh, yeah, and, and that sounds excellent. There. But uh, let me tell you how it, it first came about that... Um, that the, the idea of talking to you in public mm -hmm. came up. Um, I, I have, I've been a, a follower of yours for, for quite a while and I, I love your photography, but I particularly love the way you do your videos. Thank you. But about you. six months ago, uh, my best friend uh, sent me a text that told me to watch this video. This is how you're supposed to do it because he had been riding mm -hmm. me for two years about talking too much and my videos going on and on with all the detail <laughs> and he said this is how you do it and it was one of your videos it was a review that you were doing and uh i took it to heart been <laughs> trying to model my video on yours since because that's succinct oh. and to the point how long have you been yeah. doing videos um i posted my first youtube video uh, the autumn of 2017 so yeah, five years now, almost exactly. Um, same as me. And I'll be same as you. Yep, that's right when I started. Uh, do you have like a, a schedule or something? Like how often do you upload? Uh, no, um, I, I started out uploading two videos a week, then went to one, and now it's it, when when a project is finished, I put it up. Yeah. So. Some weeks it'll be three, some months it'll be just one, so. Yeah, kind of the same here. I I do as much work as I have time for, and it's always different every week. And sometimes it becomes four videos in a week and sometimes zero. So Exactly. Like, uh, and also I, I don't like sitting on videos that are done. I like posting them immediately when they are done because I'm so anxious to see like, what will uh, people's reaction be and so on. So I, I, I have a really hard time scheduling videos. I always just post them immediately. I can't even put them off till tomorrow. And it, it's not because, it's not so much because I want to know what people are gonna say about them. It's that if I don't put it out, things will change. And I, it, it, yeah. it won't, I'll be, you know, I was right today, but I'll be wrong tomorrow. So I don't yeah. like to wait to wait, especially for stuff that involves equipment. I mean, yeah. it's, it's do them and get them out. Yeah. How, how many projects but, yeah. do you have 
going at any given time. You do them one at a time. You mean like uh, you mean like video projects? Yeah, or, yeah. Or, if you uh, have an idea, uh, do you yeah. have three cooking? Oh, on? yeah. I like. I prefer to only have one at a time because I feel like when I'm doing a video, uh, it's a lot of different thoughts and ideas that I need to keep in my head. And then when the video is out there, I can like whew, let go of it all and kind of relax. So when I'm doing several videos at once, it, it feels a bit more stressful because it's so much to keep track of. Like I need, because the way I work, I never write stuff down. I maybe have a few words written down, but I, I try to keep everything in my head and then just talk naturally without a script or something. So I try to do one video at a time, but I always have like lots of videos in different stages. So lots of videos. Uh, let me take an example. Uh, I watched uh, one of my favorite YouTubers is Matthew Stern, a French guy who does like maybe you know about him. Does like weird lenses, yeah. And he had a video with like, this like very very old lens, like a hundred year old lens, and that got me thinking. I want to do a video like that, but with macro photography. So I purchased a very old. Le let me show you. Uh, I'm doing re so like. The first step was then ob obviously, I don't know if you can see this, well, I think it's like at least over a hundred years old. And uh, I got it pretty cheaply on eBay, but so the first step is of course to get the idea and then I need to buy the lens. And then when I get the lens, I need to research like how to mount it on my camera. So like I have lots of projects that are in different stages of this and then when I finally have all the parts and I know what the video will like how it will be then I can record it and, and publish it but since it takes so much time sometimes to get parts for a rig for example I love doing like experiments with different camera rigs uh, I need to have several of these in motion because it could take weeks before I get some parts from China or something like that I have like a Trello board with over a hundred video ideas and then I try mm -hmm. to sometimes go through them and pick the ones I want to do the most for the upcoming week or weeks but I try to only work actively on one video at a time just to keep it simple. It's, it's good to hear that, uh, that, that you deal with exactly the same thing. I have a big whiteboard yeah. on my wall. This is a, my new studio. I just moved in here a couple of weeks oh, nice. ago. And uh, I've set this area up as my permanent video studio just because everything's here. But this enormous whiteboard has just dozens of projects on it that are in various stages. Wait, not sometimes yeah. I'll forget all about the fact that I've got halfway <laughs> done doing a project, and somebody will yeah. say, Hey, have you finished that thing yet? <laughs> But it keeps it interesting. I never doing the same thing twice. Uh, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you get bored with a project and then it's nice to leave it for a while and do something more interesting and then you get new inspiration to continue. Something that's been really important to me and it, this is also new. It's only been in the last six months. Uh, my usual routine of researching and writing a, a video concept and then making the video, editing it and getting it out mm. was interrupted doing a few of these interviews, which I love to do, but also doing uh, a live stream that I started doing just a few months ago. And mm. I didn't expect to like that, but it turns out that I really do enjoy that. So I do that once a week and that kind of is one of my video slots that I fill, but the, the live stream, have you done any of that? Have you just um, Yeah, I've done a few. Yeah, I've done a few live streams. Um, I'm trying to think of the reason why I'm not doing more of them, but <laughs> actually I quite enjoyed it as well. I really love the feeling of interacting with people yes. like in real time. Uh, and also I love the feeling of sitting down, doing the live stream, and then when it ends, the video is done. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> no like extra editing or anything. It's done and I can move on. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah, but maybe it's just because for me, it's still more convenient to, to be able to edit it, to be able to kind of put in uh, images over what I'm saying and kind of illustrating it better. I feel like the end result is usually better when I'm doing like an edited video, but I think for some kinds of videos, a live stream is great. For example, like a Q&A, 
that's perfect with a live stream because then you don't need to supply any images or anything like that. Yeah, mine are, they all start out as a and a If I'm doing something like I am now, a long project with, uh, it's a five video series with We Macro, uh, just a big drawn out review really. <laughs> but every week I can give them an update and I can show them the gear and, and yeah. uh, by setting up additional cameras, it's almost like doing a video, but like you say, when I'm finished, I'm finished. I don't have six yeah. days of editing to do, so uh, it's freed yeah. up a lot of time for me. And I think uh, it can actually, like now when you're talking about it, it feels like it could be a nice forum to kind of um, keep people updated, get things off your chest, like uh, it's a nice way of keeping a log of a progress in a project. It is. And, and it works for so many things. I mean, I update people on what's going on and, and uh, tell them about projects that are coming up, get feedback. And, uh, and everybody yeah. loves to, to chat and, and be there. And the numbers are growing slowly, um, but it's, a, it's just a good platform. I'm very happy I started doing it. It's, uh, I, it's a, yeah. been a real boon, I think. Let me ask you a question about, uh, about the, the real strength i think of your channel and the, the reason i love to watch your videos is the quality and consistency of your video when you're on the go your your uh uh -huh. outdoor um in nature macro videos Have, were you trained to do this is this uh, something that you taught yourself how, how did you get so good at it uh, yeah i know I, I was not trained <laughs> actually I, I did not do photography or videography at all ever in my life until like i started my youtube channel oh. <laughs> uh, or yeah I, I mean i started with photography maybe a year before that but, but before that i was doing completely <laughs> different things no but I, I like part of the reason i love doing this i think is that it was and still is pretty new to me so I'm always learning new things and I actually enjoy testing out different cameras testing out different like ways of filming and trying to find the optimal way to do it for me I really enjoy doing that that's like part of the fun for me um, so no I'm, I'm this just trial and error and me trying to learn stuff <laughs> do you shoot multiple uh, see when when you do a close up of you shooting yeah. with a with a uh, an insect or a plant, do you do multiple takes while you're in the field, or are you camera yeah, one and so, camera yeah. the other? And... <laughs> yeah, let me show you how we do this. Uh, I have tried lots of different cameras and stuff, but what I've been using for the last year or so that I really like is um, yes. this very. This very tiny camera, I don't know if you recognize it, is the DJI Pocket 2. Yes. And uh, uh, considering how small this is, it's incredible how good video quality you get. That's what you're and using? Yeah, for your most of the time when I'm out. Yeah, outdoors, this is what I'm using. And it actually also like... Not only is it a good camera with a pretty large sensor for the, being this small, also the gimbal makes it so smooth. Because something I really hate is uh, when the footage is just like jittery and jumping around and stuff like that. Like Still, <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, most YouTubers, I think, uh, have a problem with this because obviously it's like a lot of work to to bring a gimbal, uh, or at least it's unwieldy, but this one is so small you can literally have it in your pocket. And then, uh, let me show you what I also use, hang on. Uh, I, I started in the last few months, I started combining this with a very simple uh, monopod. Uh, so this is, uh, it's called the Benro A A38FD or something. And it has, as you can see, it has three uh, feet here. So you can basically use it as a real tripod, but it's not as stable as a real tripod, but it's definitely stable enough for this camera. Uh, because I discovered that it's hard for me sometimes to find a good angle, but now I can just put it down on the ground wherever I want. And since it has a gimbal, it will always be level with the horizon. So I can even put it like uh, slightly not that even and it still works great. 
and this is so compact and convenient to, to bring around, so I really love this setup. I, I've been using a GoPro and that same Benro uh, monopod. Ooh. I use a Benro three-way tripod head as well. I, I love Benro stuff, but um, yeah, that camera, I used it once last year. Um, a, a, a friend of mine has one and, and let me use it, and I thought, I've got to get this. I didn't realize how expensive it was, though. It was a, it's they're costly, yeah. five six hundred dollars, I think, for the set. I think it was. Yeah, uh, I think I paid as little as four hundred here in Sweden, but maybe it was a campaign or something. I don't remember. Um, I remember it being a bit too much, and uh, I hate yeah. GoPros, but uh, this was a <laughs> good. I'll have to get one now because that really would yeah. make a difference. Yeah, this one has the image quality looks more cinematic than a GoPro, definitely. It does. It, it, yeah. It it, but of course, does. it's not it's not as good as a big camera. But uh, when I'm out shooting macro, I want to keep like 90% of my energy and focus on taking photos and filming myself. Like I want to have something super simple. I just press record and it should do all the job for me. And I think this is the the best setup I found for that yet, at least. Yeah, that I I would love to get. I would use that in the studio too, um, because the setup is such a pain uh, to to do yeah. in the studio. But when you're yeah. um, when you're in the studio doing a video, do you use yeah. the same setup or do you have? Uh, no, um, currently what I usually do is uh, earlier I used my my photography camera, my Sony A7 III, to record myself in the studio, but then I purchased uh, this camera. This is the Sony CV-1. Oh yeah, nice. Uh, po popular uh, vlogging camera. And actually I bought it because I wanted to try a slightly larger camera out in the field. But I found it still to be a little bit too like inconvenient. I really love the, the DJI Pocket 2. So I didn't really have any use for this. And then I discovered that this is a perfect camera for me to use uh, in the studio because yeah, it has a built-in zoom lens and it's nice to have a separate camera dedicated to filming yeah. because otherwise, yeah, I don't know, for example, if I want to show something using my photography camera, it's impossible because yeah. So uh, this one is really good. And, it's like I think it's like nine hundred dollars or something, but for this for the money it's incredibly good camera and it's so compact. So why, um, why yeah. Sony? Did you I don't know. Did I, you start with mirrorless? Uh, when I started with photography, like serious photography, in back in twenty sixteen, uh, I didn't know that this was was going to be like a big thing in my life, so I didn't want to spend too much money on a camera. <laughs> So I, I started looking at like pho photographs that inspired me and I, I, all of them were used, all the professional photographers were using like full frame Canon or Nikon cameras. Uh, but these are pretty expensive, like $2,500. And I didn't really want to spend that kind of money. I didn't even know if I was going to be serious with photography. And then I noticed that Sony had this mirrorless camera, this, the original Sony A7. And for whatever reason, I guess it didn't sell that well, so they had to lower the price. So that one was like, I don't remember, maybe $1,200. It was like insanely cheap. Uh, so I got that one uh, because it was small and cheap and it was full frame. Uh, so I think that is why I'm stuck with Sony because I mean, I, I tried lots of different camera brands, but I always came back to Sony. I, I guess it's because it's so familiar to me. I've been using it all the time. That, that's my primary macro camera, yes. Um, I tried um, Micro Four Thirds, I tried APS-C cameras, but I don't know, something with Sony full frame feels like home to me. <laughs> so uh, I always come back to it. Beautiful. What yeah. about you? Are you DSLR shooter or? It, I'm yeah I do shoot uh, DSLR but I, I have it backwards I um, I use my big camera my D850 for my video um, okay. in the studio because I use my APS-C cameras for, for my macro that's yeah. that reverses when I go outside uh, to, to do macro in the field then I take my D850 with a macro lens and that's that's my go-to setup. But in the studio, I take 
thousands and thousands of pictures every week and I shoot everything APS-C just because of the amount of data <laughs> it would be if it yeah. was full frame and uh, because I... But I, do you use Nikon DSLRs then Nikon. for APS-C as well? I yeah. use a D7500 as my um, primary macro stacking camera and then a uh, Fuji X-T2 uh, mirrorless. Mm -hmm. As a as a backup stacking camera and the D850 for video and field macro, and then mm. a, an assortment of other little cameras that I uh, I've tried for everything, um, video yeah. and what have you. But most of my work is in the studio. I mean, when I'm outdoors taking pictures, it's really for enjoyment, not for usually for videos. It's mostly just for fun. I love to be outdoors with a camera. Yeah, uh, me too. The, that's like, um, I think that is why I have a hard time doing a lot of work indoors in a studio because, I don't know, for me it's something with the combination of walking around in nature and doing something creative. That is like the a higher form of existence almost <laughs> for is. me. Uh, yeah. It is, but, my, but what I've fallen into in, in my photography career is so strange it's so different that i have to be in the studio i have to do part of it in yeah, the yeah. studio but my my main interest is is taking photographs of very common insects the kind of insects yeah. that are everywhere they're in your garden now millions of them but they're just too small to see so i i, yeah. I photograph but things that are I'm, a millimeter i'm really or curious less. i'm really curious uh, like how did you get into all this like how did it start did, are, are, have you been doing this for your whole life or did it no, start I, later i i'm actually a surgeon and and i started to to get interested in macro photography in the operating room when it was part of documenting what i was doing uh -huh. And uh, yeah, that my first macro lens was was a long, long time ago. But as when I when I got into photography more, it wasn't really into macro. Uh, that kind of came a little bit later, and I just gradually <laughs> fell into photographing things that nobody else was. Um, my my favorite thing to do is to take something common and make it look extraordinary just by photographing it and yeah. you know if i can surprise somebody or make them laugh or make them gasp at a picture of something that they see every day like a dragonfly like i, I sent you a couple of my pictures earlier on to yeah in case beautiful they, pictures they came up but this one of the dragonfly that looks so frightening is is just a common dragonfly that you see darting around at the pond but up close uh, in the studio, uh, they get everything changes, and that's what I find yeah. so appealing. And I can't do that in the field; it's just not possible. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I mean, rigs. you. I'm looking at your photos now. I, like the magnification is incredible. It must be like ten times or something like that in some of the photos. It it looks like that to me, at least. Some of them are more than that um, uh, because I, I photograph some. Some insects and, and, and things that aren't even insects, they're, bit, bit, they're more ancient than insects that are only a fraction of a millimeter long. And uh, yeah, so I'll use 20 times objectives for that. I think I sent you a picture of some uh, of the hooks that hold a wasp's wing together. Ah. It's, those, those are a set of hooks called hamuli that, that hold the wings together when the, the wasp flies so that it has a bigger surface area to, ah. to, to carry it aloft. <laughs> But uh, I mean, I, I have always wanted to try this kind of extreme magnification macro photography, but like every time I have tried it, I think pro the problem for me is I am too impatient because I need to take like hundreds of photos. I need to calculate like the depth of field and try to set the um, distance correctly. And it takes such a long time and like, and then where I do a stack and I even have an automated rail. I have, what's it called? Stack shot, I think. Uh -huh. yep. 
And, and, and then I do like a hundred photos and I discovered that, oh, I was walking around too close to it. So some of them <laughs> got weird or like some other vibration because some car passes by. Like, yeah. I don't know, I can't do it. It's too hard. <laughs> yeah. Don't you have these issues when you're doing this? I, I don't, but I have a, I, I've developed a, a way of working that allows that to run in the background. I, I plan a shot, I set it up, I get it going, and then I walk away and I write or I shoot video or I do whatever I have to do and then go back. I shoot about seven photographs a day, which usually means two, three thousand shots a day. Um, wow. And then I stack them in the background. I don't sit here and wait for them to, to be done. I use automated scripts to run through and, and then I edit them mm. and... and then I throw most of them away, believe it or not. I mean, there are... <laughs> but what, what is the most common reason you throw a photo away? What is the most common problem? It's, it's not necessarily a problem. It's just I don't like it. If, um... Okay, you don't, you don't like the aesthetics of mm -hmm. it, like how it looks, basically. So it's not a technical thing, like that the stack did not turn out good or... No, I'll usually know that ahead. Of, I'll know that before I start the stack. I mean, if... if if there is going to be a problem in the stack, I'll know it and I won't shoot the stack. But maybe one out of a hundred stacks, I'm surprised I'll shoot it and then look at the end product and say, you know, my contrast was off or the light was bad or something happened. Yeah. But, you know, it, it is, it does take a different mindset, but I don't, I don't really do macro photography as much as I teach macro photography. The, the reason I do it is, to make sure I know what I'm teaching. Uh, but yeah. I, th I think of my job as teaching it, not doing it. I don't sell my pictures or anything like that. Um, yeah, I have the same view actually. Like I call myself a photographer and YouTuber, but I don't really see myself as a photographer in that sense because my product is my videos, not yeah. my photos. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. And so my, I even, I'm even thinking about maybe just uh, uh, putting them on some license where everyone can use them, do whatever they want. Like, uh, and for example, if someone like would steal a photo of mine and publish it somewhere or something like that, I never become angry or anything. I'm just like, great. Like, because the photos are, are not the important thing uh, for me. No, they, they, they're important to me because it's the only way I can measure whether or not I'm doing the technical part as well as I can. And it's the only way I can measure my improvement is by looking at my picture from a year yeah, ago yeah. and looking at it today. But it's it, the aesthetic is important to me personally, but not from a business standpoint. It's much yeah, more exactly. important to me that if you watch my video on that topic, your, your picture will get better. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I think we have the kind of the same um, philosophy there. Like what I measure my success in is basically whenever someone messages me and says like, I got really inspired by your video. I'm doing more macro photography now. I bought this lens that you recommended, something like that. That makes me so happy because like that feels like my, uh, my ultimate goal uh with making my videos and if i can do that then everything else like it's not as important i think i absolutely mm. love that L let me ask you a completely different question sure. that, that sure. would fascinate me is your do you consider youtube your job do you uh, is, is it how you make a living? Yeah, I, I nowadays I, I do consider it my job. Like it has been a gradual thing when I started out. Obviously, I didn't make much money, but uh, I, I had like pretty good viewership from the beginning because in the beginning I managed to get a lot of my videos featured in big um, websites like DP Review and Pera Pixel and so on. So I, like I got quite a viewership already from the beginning, which was probably the reason I, I, I continued doing the videos because it was so fun to get people watching them. Uh, but it took quite a while until I made any substantial money. Uh, but now, since this spring, I don't do anything else. Like YouTube is the only thing I do. But then of course I have small children, they take a lot of time, but like this is my job. 
uh, and I've tried like working on improving the uh, the money situation, and now I think I'm at like around 70%, 70, 75% of what I need to make a living I make from YouTube after taxes. Uh, so that's where I'm at right now. And, and then the rest I supply with saved money basically from uh, my previous career. Uh, and so my goal is obviously to, to reach 100%, but I, I'm in no rush with that. I, I just try to gradually increase my income streams and uh, hopefully within a year or two I can make a living for real. That is uh, absolutely the most encouraging and fascinating thing I, I've heard you say so far. I've been doing this for <laughs> four and a half years or whatever, and I have been putting money into it since day one. I've never made a penny yeah. doing it. I make something from YouTube for adverts, and that's and something from Amazon, I think, for for some yeah. affiliate, affiliate links, maybe. Links, yeah. yeah, but uh, mostly it, it's the, it's my Patreon folks um, uh, who support me, um, yeah. and yeah. then the rest of it comes out of my savings. But uh, I don't. I thought it's the biggest mystery in the world how people can can make a living because I work sixty hours a week doing this. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, um, it's yeah. It's really hard. I I think you have to kind of play the YouTube game to, to be able to, to, to make, but like you have to do clickbaity titles, you have to, yeah, I don't know, there are a lot of like small things you need to do and um, yeah, it's, it's hard I think for people like you and me because macro photography is such a niche thing. I mean even photography is pretty niche these days, macro photography is kind of one of the smallest subgenres. Uh, so even for me, I like, like if, if you search macro photography on YouTube, I think many of my videos will show up. But still, even with that, it's hard to make a living from it. So, yeah, but I, I, I just see an overall trend that it slowly but steadily goes up. So I trust that someday it, it will be possible. <laughs> but and the thing is, uh, I think you can agree on this. Like, we are so passionate about making these videos, at least I am, so to me it doesn't really matter that much if in, in two or three years I realize that, oh, I will never be able to make a living from this. As long as I can get by somehow, um, financially, I, like, the biggest win for me is just to spend my days doing this because it's so enjoyable. Absolutely, 100%. That, that is... That is, and that's what I tell my Patreon folks every time I talk to them, is that... The, and I thank them for making it possible for me to do this every day instead of going to work. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, if if I if I ever make a living doing it, if I, if I can ever cover my bills, I won't notice a difference so long as I'm still doing this. So it's 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 not that important. But getting to do this is important. I mean, um, I, I I cannot imagine life now without this. I mean, it's that important. One of the questions that I know uh, my viewers are going to want to know is, what macro photographers do you follow? Who, who, who are you interested in? Whose work do you love? Or who inspired you? Uh, yeah, I mean, at, it, for me, it all started... I can really remember the day and the moment in, uh, I think it was 20, yeah, 2016, uh, like uh, in the summer, I was browsing around YouTube for like photography videos. And back then I wasn't really into macro photography. I tried all different genres. I was just like, you know, a regular photography interested guy. And then I stumbled upon some videos by Thomas Shaham. Uh, like he's he has a couple of videos that have have like lots and lots of views. I think it was probably these videos that I watched, and I was I was so blown away by how beautiful the photos were. I hadn't really seen. I don't think I had seen any proper macro photos before then in my life, basically. And I was like, wow! And he does this freehand. He just walks around and photographs insects and get these kind of photos. And so the next day, I just went into town, bought a macro lens, and decided I, I need to try this. Uh, so I have to say, and, and today, I, I mean, on Instagram, for example, I follow, I probably follow over 100 macro photographers, if not 200. 
maybe even more. I lost track. Uh, but still, I think that Thomas Sheahan is one of my favorite macro photographers. There is something with the way he composes the photo and gets like the background color to contrast against the insect. Like, it, 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 they are so pleasing to look at, his photos. Well, I knew I knew there was something about you that that clicked with me. I mean, Thomas was the the guy that that I wanted to shoot like. I mean, he, he was absolutely my my inspiration. Yeah, I think he probably like started the whole generation of macro photographers, like to inspire them to to start doing it, and like. He, do, he didn't even he didn't only inspire me when it came to the photography also like the way I do my videos and the way I like for example for the first three or four years I only did like voiceover videos in exactly the same style as he did because I don't know it just felt natural and I guess it was because his videos inspired me so much uh, then lately I started to experiment with other ways of doing it but but uh, yeah so that's the, the, like the big name for me um uh, another photog macro photographer that I think is really really talented and I really like the style is I don't know her full name but her name on Instagram is macro by merit and she also is really talented at the composition and and finding a background that complements the subject in a really nice way and she does handheld stacks like Thomas Sheehan does um, like really well and uh, she gets some very beautiful results. Uh, that is another favorite of mine. And, and mine. Have you, have you ever heard of a photographer by the name of Andy Murray? Andy Murray's specialty is photographing uh, soil mesofauna, the, uh, uh, the tiny little things that live in the, the soil that aren't quite insects. That sounds yet. really interesting. I oh. actually saw like a photo series on Twitter the other day. Maybe it was his photos about this kind of stuff. Yes, uh, um, I interviewed him last year uh, on, huh? on my channel and uh, he he breaks all the rules. He, he takes pictures um, at uh, 17 times magnification uh, with <laughs> Uh, an MPE 65 on you know, a foot and a half of extension, yeah. yet his pictures are just mesmerizing, and uh, I think that that you will love them. It, it's oh, I'm, he inspires yeah, I'm curious to see them now all the time. So I, I'm hoping yeah. to get him back on again this year because he was so yeah. popular and people were just blown away by the quality of his images. You should definitely check yeah. them out. What uh, is that like your main inspiration when it comes to taking like long stacks or do you have others as well that you that kind of inspired you to start doing this? Yes, and well, it's it, it's my love affair with macro is very complicated. It's it's partly the technical. I love the yeah. I love coming up with new ways to to use lenses and microscope objectives and and, and finding the just the tiny improvements that make such a big difference in the end so yeah. there is the technical part but unlike the technical part i'm also motivated by the aesthetic i if my picture at the at the end is not pleasing to me to look at and by pleasing it needs to be surprising or, or funny or scary yeah. it needs to i i tend to put human characteristics into to my subjects and try to photograph them as if they're people. Like, they, I think I sent you a picture of a, 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 an Ick Newman wasp, a very dainty looking wasp that appears to be prancing across the, the purple background. That, yeah, that beautiful makes, photo. makes me think of a, a ballerina. Uh, and I'll, yeah, me too. I'll, I'll finish that theme by photographing that insect to look like that. And yeah. uh, so that's, to me, it's, it's very complicated of how I plan a shot. And I'll, I'll spend hours under the microscope. I have a big microscope by my desk and I'll spend hours looking at the insects in all different ways to s till something jumps out at me. This is the way you need to photograph that. Yeah. And then I go do it. So, um, yeah, and that's what I try to teach people too, is there's, there's the technical, 
then there's the aesthetic and you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah that's true. And that's what makes the long days worthwhile. But that summar summarizes also my, my view of photography, what's, what's so exciting about it and what's uh, so fun about it that it's like, 50, as you say, it's like 50% uh, the, the technical stuff and the, having the right equipment and using it in the right way. And then it's 50% making something beautiful or like emotion, uh, something that provokes emo emotions in some way. And it's, it's so nice with these areas where we can combine these two. Uh, and photography is, is one of those. Do, do you have a photograph? or a group of photographs that stand out to you as the best photographs you've ever taken? Hard to answer, actually. Like, yeah, I have maybe, like, I, had, I don't have like a clearly defined collection of photos that are my favorite, but sure, I have like, for example, each year I look back at each like macro season, and then there are usually like four or five photos that I'm more happy with than the others. How many? Uh, so that four or five maybe that I'm like more happy with. Uh, but no, I, and, and actually I don't spend a lot of time looking at my old photos. Uh, I, I, I have them in the back of my mind somewhere, but only because I want to remember how they are so I can try to take better ones, <laughs> basically. Uh, uh, but but sure, yeah. I mean, I can definitely uh, if I sit if I sit for a while and look through old photos, I can definitely pick like for example my fifty favorites. I would probably be able to do that, but that I don't do it that often. Uh, have you have you ever had the experience of of having a, a portfolio or having a, a group of photographs that you think represent your work, and then? the next year you go back and you look at them again and you throw half of them out <laughs> because you don't like them anymore. I mean, this happens to me. All My favorite photograph is different today than it was yeah. yesterday and then it'll be tomorrow. And it's funny because, um, for example, when I look in my Lightroom catalog at the oldest photos when I started with photography, I remember I was very happy with some of these photos, like very happy. And and today they really look, I'm not that happy about them today. They look, really look like beginner photos, yeah. as you say. Like, But, but then as you progress, um, when you have taken another step and you look back at the photos from the previous step, even though you were, you were very excited about them then, they don't look good now. So yeah, that's a very interesting thing. And, and probably it's not always a, like a upward progression. Probably it's like you say that we change taste as well. Um, I yes. think as you get more into macro photography, you start recognizing what kind of photos are harder to take and then you put some value in that as well. But a beginner would not be able to differentiate between a photo that is difficult to make from an easy one, but yeah. and there are there are some photographs that I don't know how I took them. I I just I I think they're my lucky uh, uh, happy accidents is what I call them. <laughs> I, I don't remember consciously setting it up to get that look, but I got that look and I love it, and it's yeah. one of my favorite pictures. But I couldn't repeat it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a. Uh, but but isn't that like that is photography for me like you always have a goal you try to you have like some kind of goal in mind usually when you try to take a photo but it never at least for me it never ever comes out exactly how you imagined it but the best photos are the ones that come out better than you imagine it by some kind of accident <laughs> at least that is like what it's like for me they're the magical ones yeah and I, and, yeah. I, and I have a, a handful of those but four or five out of a year that really stand out is, I think, pretty good. That's what I would say. I, that if I have yeah. 25 pictures from this YouTube experience that are that I would consider good, I, I think that would be that would be about the maximum I could come up with. There's lots that are okay, but there's yeah. just a probably half that, probably a dozen that I think are there. What I wanted to, to show. Yeah. Uh, do you do any teaching other than teaching the masses through YouTube? Do you ever give talks or uh, um, teach in person? No, um, not at the moment. Like right now, 
I really try to focus on my YouTube channel and nothing else uh, because I, I want to get up on that level where I can actually make a living from it and then maybe I can relax a bit more but I really want to reach that goal that is like an important thing for me and now I'm really close to it so actually this year I've said no to several such things like ha holding a talk or something because I feel like if I spend the same amount of time preparing a YouTube video, thousands of people will see it instead of maybe a hundred or fifty or twenty. Uh, actually I have one talk planned that is a local photography club here in my, my hometown. And that is mostly because I want to meet other photographers uh, the, uh, that live close by. Uh, so I will hold a talk there. But now at the moment I'd really try to focus 100% on, on my on my YouTube channel. I I consider the time I spend giving talks and I do a lot of talks uh, on on Zoom uh, to camera clubs. I have been ever since the pandemic started. Uh, I consider it one of the and obviously I'm wrong because you're the <laughs> you're the one with the viewers, but I have always thought of it as an investment and a, a lot of my Patreon supporters came to my channel by watching one of my talks. Yeah. And um, I, I think it's good PR, but uh, I see your point that putting that time in, but you see, my talks end up as videos too, because I will ask permission to release it as a yeah, video. Yeah, then so. it's a different thing. Then you can, uh, yeah, then you get both things out of it, so to say. Yeah, yeah, uh, which, yeah. which is kind of what we're doing here as well. I mean, it, it makes yeah. sense, we, we both, Somebody said to me when I when I mentioned to them that I was going to be talking to you, they said, well, he won't talk to you because uh, he's the competition. <laughs> have, do you even have that concept of, of you no. and I being in competition for something? No, I don't think so because uh, we are part of a pretty small sub-genre on YouTube. Uh, uh, and I think that the more we cooperate and support each other, the bigger macro photography as, as an interest can be. And that will, of course, be good for both of us. Uh, so, I, no, I, no, I don't... I, like, I think the most important thing to us is just to grow interest in macro photography worldwide. Uh, and if we do these kind of things, that would probably help. So, I, no, I don't... I don't feel like, like, the thing is that the people who are interested in macro photography, they will probably subscribe to both you and me and Thomas J.M. and St Stuart Wood, like, and watch all of, of our videos. It's not like, now I'm only going to watch Michael and not Alan Walsh, like, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah. people tend to, to watch them all because there aren't that many macro photography YouTubers. I've mm. never th thought of... Uh, of, of being in competition with anybody. I mean, uh, it's, yeah. it's, we're all having a hard time making a living. I mean, it, it seems <laughs> like uh, uh, we, and we would have a lot to, to talk about, especially, I mean, our work is so different. And so, I mean, yeah. we're in niches of our own within niches. Are you planning yeah. on doing something uh, that, with your channel to, to push you over that limit? Have you got any new plans? That is that is something I I think about every day. I and it, I think it's mostly a lot of different small things I do all the time to try to grow. Uh, but right now my strategy is basically to um, uh, just make lots of videos as many as I can and do videos that I enjoy making because it seems like that is the kind of videos that my viewers also enjoy. So that's great. Uh, and also like, I want to keep this, like my number one priority, much more important than making a living is having fun with it. So I never compromise on that. I only do videos that I feel like making, but the, the strategy I have to try to grow more is to, to uh, always be working on at least one video with viral potential. Uh, so I discovered that there, are a, there is a certain type of videos that I make that, that can get a lot of views. I have a few videos with hundreds of thousands of views. And that is the video with like some kind of special or weird macro lens that is kind of unexpected in some way. 
for example, I made a video uh, uh, this spring uh, with an adapter to put a microscope lens on your camera, 3D printed adapter uh, that by an Australian guy Very called Nick video. Sherlock. Yeah. That video, I don't know how many views it has now, but uh, I think above what 200,000. And then <laughs> Nick Sherlock, the guy who made this adapter, made another adapter to put a wide angle lens in front of the microscope lens to get uh, like your own Laowa uh, pers um, probe lens. And that video also got like hundreds of thousands of views. So I always try to be planning one of these videos and now, right now it is this one with the with the 120 year old uh, oh, yeah. um, lens and like there, of course I think it's fun to try something like this but I'm doing it mostly because I know that this is kind of video that could get hundreds of thousands of views and that translates to many new subscribers and many new viewers so I always try to be working on one of these to, to spice it up a little. Well, let me tell you, I do every video about some strange uh, <laughs> a microscope uh, objective or combination of lenses, and I've never had 5,000 people look at it. So it, it must be something else you're doing besides the lens. Yeah, I think, <laughs> as, I was, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, I think uh, what... Uh, what I try to do that's also important is to kind of play the YouTube game, like try to, to study what kind of titles do viral videos have, what kind of thumbnails do they have and try to always like, of course, I would rather not be spending time on that, but I know that it is important to, to, to have a chance to, to, to grow the channel. So that is something I also work a lot on. Tell me then, what is the secret to, uh, to your cover your your thumbnail what makes what makes a good thumbnail i spend um, hours making mine because i i actually have them in a collection because i i enjoy doing <laughs> that yeah i think that uh, i like i don't have I, I don't think that you should look at my answer as the definite answer i have my own approach that has worked for me or that sometimes work for me and that is basically that i always use uh, I, I always try to make the thumbnail as simple as possible, like a simple clear shape that, that draws the eye. So for example, if the video is about a lens, then I just show that lens against a white background, like super clean, super simple. That kind of makes it stand out a bit. And what I also discovered when I look at the data is that what's more important than the title or the thumbnail, those are important, but what's even more important is the idea of the video to try to uh, and this is hard, of course, but try to sense what kind of videos uh, is your audience uh, like most interested in and try to focus more and more and more towards those videos. So I have discovered my audience is mostly interested in uh, cheap, weird macro lenses that I walk around with outside. Those are the videos that are super successful for me. And I know that YouTube's algorithm works like this, that they always test the video on your own audience. And if your own audience loves it and clicks a lot on it, then it, they will show it to a lot more people. So you always have to think about that. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a process and you slowly, slowly get better at it. But it's hard. I, yeah, I'm definitely not getting better at it. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know what, what I'm trying to do. Um, because I, I hear everything you're saying, and I just had the idea for the cover for this video that's yeah. going to be brilliant. I, I won't tell you, I'll just show it to you, and you'll, yeah. you'll, because it's going to follow your, your formula. But, uh, yeah. but my goodness, uh, I mean, I, I don't think about it when I make a, a video until after the fact. I mean, it's not as important as what's in the video, but. I suppose it is as important as what's in the video if nobody's watching it. And another thing is, uh, that's important to remember is that when I've studied other channels that have been like successful to try to learn like their secret, what I very often discover is that many channels that are pretty big, they built the whole channel on just one of their videos that became extremely uh, viral. So basically they had a video that, that had lots, thousands of views every day for five years. 
and that is like what built the whole channel. So some, I think like to some extent, it's probably just luck as well. Like for whatever reason, the algorithm picks up a video and it becomes very popular and it stays there for, for a long time. Well, I would like to make one of those videos. Maybe this will be that video for both of us. Exactly. <laughs> no, but yeah, I think this one is probably far too long to, to, <laughs> to be yes. that, but you it never will. know. It, it'll be a bit shorter by the time it goes out, but I think you're probably yeah. right. Did want to ask you one question. How long is your season in Sweden? Is Microphotography? It, yeah, how, yeah, how it's, many it's, months it's, can you be out there? Yeah, it's pretty short. I would say that... Uh, now I've had a few seasons, so I started to see like the patterns where each um, species uh, can be found and so on. But towards the end of April, beginning of May, I can start doing macro photography outdoors because then you can see some ants crawling, crawling around that are usually the first ones. And then, yeah, towards the end of September, I think the last insects uh, start to hide somewhere. Uh, I mean, even now in October, like today it was a warm day, so I actually saw a few insects, but it's like, it's practically impossible nowadays to do macro photography. So now the long winter starts. <laughs> the next winter that, that you have no bugs to photograph, you should let me teach you how to do extreme macro in the studio. Because yeah, can, that would you be can do that all winter long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I actually purchased a box of uh, dead insects. I, I've never had any before, like to, to photograph. I have never bought one, but I'm doing a video. I compared all of the sellers, the big ones, ah, and, and I, I bought bugs from every one of them. And I've done a lot of research, and that video is coming out in a, about, a, uh, well, about four more weeks. Yeah, that will be interesting to see. Uh, no, so I, I plan on doing uh, I plan on doing some stacking uh, this winter, definitely. Um, I want to I want to see those videos, definitely. Yeah, I think that is one difference probably between you and me. It seems like you are much more patient than me because <laughs> I always just go crazy when I do these stacks <laughs> and something goes wrong and I have to redo it and yeah, but. Maybe it's just that I need to develop a good process like you have, like, that just works. <laughs> well, listen, I, I feel like I've taken up uh, far too much of your time, but uh, I don't know what my viewers are going to think, but I think that this was, this was a, a definite success and uh, something that yeah, I, me too. I, I hope... It was very nice. I mean, I don't view it at all at, as taking up my time. I, it was just fun and very interesting to have this conversation. Well, uh, Excellent. Really? I, I feel the same way and I feel like there's a lot still to talk about so maybe we can do yeah. this again at some time in the future. Yeah, I, yeah, I also feel like that that we only scratched the surface here and it's, it's the first time we talk so I, I also look forward to talking again sometime. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Mike. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> bye bye. Good afternoon. Bye bye. A huge thanks to Michael Wydell. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I hope you learned a lot and found it as inspirational as I did. I will include some links down below of where you can find Michael's work, Michael's YouTube channel, and uh, some of the um, equipment that we talked about today. All of that will be in the show description down below. I don't know what's coming up next, but it'll also be good. If this experiment worked for you, please leave me a note in the comments. Go support Michael. He's one of the good guys. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Have a good day.